So yeah, we're de dealing with um, ecological identities and initiatives in Russia's regions. My background is as a forest ecologist. I've worked with Russian forest mostly from afar for a long time. Uh, therefore, I can, I can talk a lot about Panis Siberica. I tend to mispronounce Russian terms. Just don't, don't laugh too much if I try. Um, what drew me to Russia was the fact it has the largest forest on Earth. Russia owns more of the Earth's terrestrial carbon than any nation on the, in the world. If you count the frozen carbon in the ground of the permafrost of the taiga, it holds one-third of the Earth's carbon, which means when you warm it, you produce a greenhouse gas that can induce further warming. And Russia has the interesting feature that warming Russia from a greenhouse of warming could produce more warming. It's like a, it kicks in and adds more. It, it is perhaps unique in this regard. It's certainly both a treasure to Russia and also scientifically a place of great, great interest. It emerges at the confluence of several different projects. My long-term interest in the work of Ivan Turgenev, which led me initially to the Ariol region south of Moscow, and an ongoing project examining cultures of water in Russia, a collaboration with Aya Rosenholm in Finland, and other European and American scholars. As my contribution to that water project, I've embarked on the exploration of holy springs in the Arlovskaya Oblast, a project that opens a series of intriguing questions and avenues for explanation for exploration about the relationship between canonic literature and place, about the revelations and erasures of particular places in literary writing, and about the long-term identities of a place like Ariol, very much bound up with the fame brought by canonic literary figures. Some of these questions are connected to my current institutional and intellectual home in environmental studies, where questions about how people value place um, how they articulate and defend particular places have come to occupy an increasingly central role in my teaching and writing. This work on the Springs of Ariol has both literary and experiential roots. Since I first went to Ariol because of Turgenev 30 years ago, <laughs> but then found Ariol so fascinating and amenable to travel with students that I've returned at least a dozen times, often for month-long stays. The landscapes and springs I'm working on in these projects are places, places I've visited repeatedly over the years, places where I've heard interesting stories from locals, places that have also generated their own streams of new narrative. Those new streams are the final piece of what intrigues me about this project. Um, interestingly enough, my interest in trying to understand the phenomenological or experiential aspect of place has led me not just to particular topographies and embodied rituals, but to the internet and cyber stories. For it turns out that if you want to understand these springs, meaning for contemporary Arlov Chanya, or even simply to find them, the web is a key source. The sources of my title are then multiple. Hydrological features um, in a landscape that is hospitable to them, place-based sources of identity, evident both in narrative and in rituals of visitation and memory, and web sources that emerge as new mediums of narrative circulation. So, um, yeah, Ariol Radnik, a website chiefly concerned to gather information about Holy Springs and make it possible for people to find them, claims that there are at least 100 Holy Springs in the Ariol region. That's a number that keeps growing. The site is not an official church site, and there's some evidence that the church itself thinks that there are fewer Holy Springs, uh, which is hardly surprising since springs like this have historically occasioned disputes between local faithful and church authorities. Whether or not that's a lot of springs, I have no idea. I need to talk to a hydrologist. The oblast sits at the intermediate point between open steppe and northern forest and includes a significant swath of glacial incursion in the northwest that is home to vegetation associated with much more northerly regions. 
Sources I've consulted refer to the significant number of underground rivers that underlie parts of the region, which on its surface is characterized by ravines. Uh, this is a map on the site of somebody I'll talk about in a little bit, Oleg Davidov, who's a Moscow-based um, writer and essayist. And this is his map of the region, which I actually really love. This is what you would call a bioregionalist map. That's an American term that I hope some of you are familiar with. And what it is, um, is the Akha River network, which as far as I can tell, looks like a pair of lungs with Moscow, a very, 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 very tiny little heart up there, um, but anyway. Um, but he notes that the Ariol region brings together the headwaters of three major river systems, the Dnieper, the Volga, and the Don. The claim on the Ariol Rodnik website, however, isn't for the existence of springs per se, but holy springs. Now, just what is meant by sacred is a complex question. Ethnographers and historians of religion often use the term venerated, suggesting popular attributions of healing properties to a particular land form. Veneration attested in many, many, many cultures um, and which almost always or always precedes institutional consecration. I will note that the most compelling discussions for me of the sanctity of particular places involve a recognition not simply of cultural constructions, but of the place itself, an acknowledgement that places are not blank slates, um, but participate in and to some extent draw forth the cultural meanings attributed to them. Holy Springs in the Ariol region are quite obviously embedded in received and evolving systems of symbolic meaning that involve popular belief, Russian Orthodoxy, Krajevedinia, histories of both pre-revolutionary and post-Soviet Russia. But there is also something about the experiential, the phenomenological reciprocity of humans and the more than human in these places, which also needs to be recognized and thought about. Um, so to ground us a bit, I'm going to give you a very brief description of one of the springs I visited at Salty Key, uh, which is south of Ariol on the road to Kursk. The site is actually comprised of two springs emerging from a limestone bluff at a place where the Akha River makes an almost right degree turn. From the top of the bluff, you look out on a broad agricultural landscape. Below, it's shaded, and there's a dirt road that allows people to drive up if they don't want to make the steep descent on foot. The springs themselves create a kind of grotto into which is set small icons. A tree on one side is covered with scraps of cloth and ribbon left by visitors as gestures of prayer or supplication. There's a sign um, asking people not to leave garbage. Sites like this often instruct visitors in various forms of appropriate behavior, including what an American would call leave no trace. The last time I visited, which was about a year ago, the instructions were being respected and the pile of trash that had been there in 2006 was gone. Visitors come to the spring either for what I'll call utilitarian or spiritual reasons, to collect water in big receptacles, municipal water systems being what they are. Water from springs is highly valued for purity and taste, or they come to make a series of ritual washings as pilgrims. Depending on the spring and the infrastructure, one can dip one's hands, drink water, or fully immerse oneself in a specially constructed and enclosed pool. The Salty Key Spring has no infrastructure at all. I visited twice, both times, accompanied by two remarkable local priests, one Catholic, who you see here, Polish Catholic, and one Orthodox. Their account of the history of the site includes its function as a place of covert baptism during the Soviet era and a place of popular veneration that at various points Soviet authorities attempted to either destroy or contaminate. Both of these motifs, covert liturgical site and attempts at spoiling are widespread in internet histories of other springs in the region. So I want to weave back for a moment to the literary origins of my interest in these springs, since it was Turgenev who first got me here. Um, and representation of places like this in canonic texts is part of what interests me. Turgenev includes an indirect description of another of Ariol's springs in his 1853 Pagetska Palesia, which is a narrative about a two-day trip into a forbidding forest in the northwest corner of the region. 
The hunter narrator of that story is rescued from a bout of extreme angst by his peasant guide who brings him water from a nearby spring. The simple gesture of offering water gets loaded in the story with cultural symbolism, an echo of living waters, which um, is a reference to both folk culture and Christianity, but also the invocation of a landscape of hiddenness that promises resuscitation for the world-weary intelligent. There's a striking repetition of this topological conceit in a novel written a, a century later, Leonid Leonov's 1953 Ruski Lies. Two boys, the future environmental hero and his boyhood friend, who's a budding capitalist, get lost in a forest and rescued by an old woodsman. The encounter with both the peasant figure and the forest involves imbibing the spirit of the place in a drink of spring water. And I'm gonna quote, um, there's quite explicit mythologization, mythologizing in Leonov's text. And I'm quoting here, uh, the spring, is no bigger than a child's palm, but is nonetheless the cradle of a great Russian river. That river separates the northern plain into two halves, so that half of the country was watered with living water from this gully. There were neither earthen embankments nor Kremlin walls nearby, but all that the state called its own. Endless fields with their overarching storm clouds, libraries and archives and powerful industry, forests and mountains along its borders served as strong and steadfast sheathing to this spring. It is for this that a people builds insurmountable strongholds of spirit and strength, uh, maintains ranks of force along its borders and puts its best on sleepless guard so that no unclean footstep may enter, may not trouble or pollute this pure stream. Both of these literary evocations of springs sacralize contact with the place and its waters, suggesting pilgrimage and transformation, but also an interesting inversion of national geography. Leonov's language in particular suggests that everything that is public, visible, and mighty depends on this hidden, unacknowledged place. This is certainly a version of what Chris Ely has identified as the major trope of landscape aesthetics in 19th century Russia, a meager nature, nature that situates national identity not in the sublime, but in the understated and often unseen. Um, and I'm just interested here whether, um, how do particular places, how do particular places function in rhetoric like this? Is Leonov flipping the map of Soviet achievements emphasizing and in a sense elevating a tiny place on which the whole Soviet world stands, or is it the opposite? That it's, this is actually an instance of the erasure of the particular, the elision of place in the surface of a grander vision. So there are a couple of things that I wanna make sure to talk about before my time is up. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the stories that get generated on these enormously rich websites. Um, there are a number that I've looked at. Uh, some of, there's, there's one that is devoted exclusively to the springs of Ariol. It was um, started in 2007, I think, um, by a young man who had tr tried to use a local map to find the springs and kind of got lost. And so he has started this project, which is a, um, has become a project that draws into it um, interactively all sorts of stories that people send him. Um, about local springs. There's also, um, that's the one in the top left. On the bottom is actually a national level website, um, which doesn't have the same level of detail and to some extent copies what's on the local site. But it's, I find it really interesting because it, it includes a kind of Gustavaya Kniga where people place stories about their experiences and their memories of some of these places, which I find really, really interesting. There's also been streams of conversation about the strings on this other site, which is called ariolstory.ru, and it's a kind of um, independent Krajevedinja project. And so, um, interestingly enough, in terms of how these stories start to circulate, they started, they, the discussion went on for a couple of years. There were about 20 people who were actively participating. And they started with a list that was generated by the local environmental um, office, um, about um, which tests these springs for coliform bacteria, particularly at the time of Epiphany, um, which is a time when ritually Russians would be going, uh, Orthodox would be going and dipping into 
um, the, the bodies of water, and so they're testing for water purity. But that's interesting because it was actually generated by this scientific, um, this scientific uh, body, um, environmental body. Um, I also, I think I'm not gonna try to talk about this right now because I wanna, um, I wanna move along, but I'm fascinated, um, there's a huge mix of genres on these sites. And I would say that there's hagiography, there's legend, there's history, there's local legend, um, there's, the, I, I mean, local history. Um, there's history not only of, say, the pre-revolutionary era, but also the Soviet era, um, and, and the continued existence of these places through the Soviet era. And then there are histories of the recovery of the places. And that's part of what I actually find really quite fascinating about them, um, because recovery is a major motif in all of the, you know, the stories of miraculous healing which is like a big part of what is on these sites. But there's another sense in which these sites are about recovery, and that's less individual than I would say communal or communitarian. It's about the communal uh, recovery of these places. And sometimes that's simply a matter of finding out where they are, clearing them out, and then starting to, um, to uh, make them accessible to people who want to come to them. And um, sometimes that involves building infrastructure but not always. Um, I think I won't talk here about there, there are two, because I'm interested in the way places like this get represented in literary discourse or not. And so I um, somewhat accidentally stumbled on two different writers who have written, professional writers who have written about them. So in terms of you know, streams of narrative, there's lots and lots and lots of you know, amateur, um, local trading of memories. And then these two are professional writers, Alek Davidov, who writes on a web journal um, called Perimianli, and he's written about one of these sites um, as part of a huge, long series that he did called Mista Sili, um, which is really a kind of what I would call a sort of postmodern pilgrimage to sites of power. And he's interested in sort of why it is that, um, how to account for the aura and the power of places, some of which are monastic sites, um, but some of which, like this particular spring, um, is not attached to a monastery or, or um, has more of a kind of leftover Soviet in infrastructure than, than a church infrastructure. Um, the other writer is a, is a local named Gennady Mikheyev, who's also writing a series of Wichirki about um, about the about regions, um, and he uh, has a really nice essay about another one of these sacred sites, and I, I, I won't go into details, but uh, um, the tones of both writers are, are really quite interesting. I think um, Davidov is more distant, sardonic, um, not very interested in local people, whom he calls abarigianli. I mean, it seems to me to call the locals Aborigines is not great. Um, and then, and then Mikheyev is really all about sort of capturing the stories of locals. I mean, I did start with Turgenev, and I'm interested in, in the way in which writers collect memories and stories and experiences of place. So uh, I think maybe both of these writers are, in a sense, kind of continuations of that Ocherk genre. Um, OK, final, um, well. I'll, we'll get to this in a minute. Um, one way to think about these places is, of course, in ecological terms. For many visitors, they are sources of what is perceived as pure water. Um, in a society where concerns about water quality and municipal water systems are widespread. The author of a 2002 essay in Mir i Musee, a journal published at Yasnaya Palyana, suggests a de facto link between Holy Springs, local history, and environmental protection. Some of the springs are designated as local, regional, or federal level protected areas. Um, this is not the Zapavetniki that were mentioned, but Pamitniki um, Prirodi, um, which means in principle that all economic activities are curtailed. Um, I already mentioned that the local environmental service does some testing um, of the water. Um, there's a little bit of coverage in the local press about concerns with um, water quality and water sources, but it's mostly actually about fishing and access to fishing um, 
fishing sites and, and relatively little concern with uh, water quality at the springs. Um, the, the author of this, um, and I'll also just note without going into detail that um, there's an interesting kind of mix of scientific and sacred discourses on, on many of these, of these websites, including references to Soviet era water testing um, to provide some sort of indication of what the chemical um, makeup of the water is and why it might be um, medicinal or, or healing. Okay, I'll wind it down. Um, this is just a slide that shows you how there's a, a kind of commodification of this that goes on as well, um, which is maybe a different version of the deterritorialization of place that, that might be going on in the Leonov, um, because I'd say that this is about a sort of generic Russian landscape without any indication of it being a particular place. This is not, um, or, or it's a kind of, yeah. Um, okay, I'll finish up here. The holy springs of the Ariol region intrigue me for various reasons that have to do with ideas of nature, vernacular and official understandings of the sacred, and how everyday histories enter longer lived fields of memory and meaning. I would identify these sites, both the springs themselves and the websites, as examples of placemaking in contemporary Russia. I mean by that both the physical construction and reconstruction of these places and the telling of stories about them. Whether this qualifies as civic action is, I think, an intriguing and important question. While there are examples on the Ariol Radnik site of seemingly self-directed community recovery projects, there are other examples where powerful institutional forces have entered the picture. The Palesia Spring, for example, is cited in what is now a national park, a project initiated by then Governor Yegor Stroyev in 1994. At the Andreevsky Radnik, in the southern part of the oblast, what were simple and charming open structures, um, including what I would call a vernacular altar, have been replaced by much more solid enclosed structures financed by a local businessman. Is such improvement a form of erasure of unsophisticated and vulnerable expression, or do local voices, desires, histories find in them new forms of inflection? That, I think, is a key question, not just for buildings, but for writing and the cultural imagination, forms of infrastructure in which the local can turn out to be the living water, which, as Leonov puts it, the country as a whole serves only to protect. Thanks. Thank you, Jim.